Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're exploring a potential fourth surge and other lingering COVID-19 questions. I'm joined today by Dr. Harris Pastides, an AMA trustee and president emeritus of the University of South Carolina. Dr. Pastides also worked with national and international organizations, including the World Health Organization and the National Institutes of Health. He has a PhD in epidemiology and is calling in from Charleston, South Carolina. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Dr. Pastides, thanks for joining us. It's good to see you back here. Um, we've been seeing headlines about a potential fourth surge in the U.S. Uh, what's your take on the recent uptick in cases? Well, if you look, Todd, at the history of how epidemics or pandemics decline, there are always blips. In other words, the curve that we always uh, look forward to so much is never a monotonic uh, line that goes from peak to uh, gone. So there are always some peaks and, and, and valleys even. The question with this one, with the outbreak in states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, New York, and Florida, is whether this is in fact only a blip or a sign of worse things to come. And I, I know we'll be talking about that. Um, you know, when you look at uh, that kind of trajectory in some of these states where you're seeing Michigan for, you know, number of cases kind of doubling, uh, you know, how much of a cause for concern in the kind of blip versus, uh, you know, trend? Well, you know, the, the tried and tested uh, path of, let's say, the Centers for Disease Control when you had uh, outbreaks of any kind really is to bring in your interventions where they're most needed. So I think we've got a number of states now that, 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 that are spiking and whether debating whether these will go away on their own or whether they will, we will see additional increases, we need to get the resources right to them. Uh, if this were, uh, for example, a foodborne outbreak or this were another kind of uh, infectious disease, hepatitis, you name it, we would be investing new and more resources uh, to those communities. So I think that's what we need to do, like, like public health firefighters, uh, going in, uh, it's hard to imagine taking resources away from other communities, so I'm not advocating that, but as new resources come in line, I think we need to concentrate them in those in those areas. So talk a little bit more about that. I, I like that public health firefighters kind of metaphor. You know, when we see kind of increases like this, you know, where like the ember kind of explodes and kind of full on fire, you know, what is that kind of force that goes into a state and provides that level of intervention that you're talking? Surely, well, well part of, the, part of the, the dilemma, of course, is that we are 50 states, and so you've got to cross boundaries, and, and in the United States, that's more difficult than it would be in almost any other uh, country in the world. But, but, but with some specificity, what I would say is you need to bring in uh, rapid testing and rapid vac vaccination teams with tents or use athletic uh, stadia, for example, or other facilities, uh, public parks, and just start bringing in all the people from those arenas without from those locations without really respect to their age or anything, because what you have there, and it could be meteorological, you know, one has to wonder why the northern states right now and why Florida, and I think, frankly, there are different reasons. Uh, Florida is the place where most young people during the spring flock and other tourists flock because of the weather and also because there are fewer restrictions and no mandates. And so I think the reason for Florida being high, it has nothing to do with the reason for Michigan being uh, high. And so, uh, but regardless of the reason, you know, public health can squander and waste a lot of time wondering why. The real thing isn't to ask why right now, but it's to bring in vaccination teams and really bring in people, forgive me when I say this, but off the street, if they're not vaccinated, get everybody in those communities that are spiking vaccinated by any of the three approved vaccines right now, do it as quickly as possible. Well, Dr. Pastides, uh, you know, speaking of vaccines, you know, you know, we're kind of in a race right now between uh, vaccines and variants in your book, which which is winning? Well, I think vaccines uh, will win. Uh, I do think that variants are of concern, and I'm fairly confident, uh, although I hate to predict anything in the realm of medicine or public health, that we uh, will continue to need vaccines against COVID uh, variants in the future. 
by the way, both Moderna and Pfizer have been shown to be effective for at least six months. I hope it will be longer than that, but we have good good experience now for six months. Uh, uh, J and J, we d we're not we're not so sure, but we're hopeful about that one as well. And so uh, variants will continue, Todd. And uh, uh, now there's uh, information about a so-called double variant, which sounds scary, but th th this is the nature of viruses. They are among the most elemental forms of life that we know, uh, barely above uh, plant life. And just about the only thing they can do when we are winning a war against them is to mutate. And a double mutation simply means that it's one more degree of freedom away from the original, um, whatever we call that original Wuhan or whatever we call it, that happened in early uh, 2020. Uh, we have to be concerned that eventually there will be a mutation that renders the vaccines that we've been taking uh, ineffective, and we're nowhere near that right now. So uh, it's important to have our guard up, to be vigilant, uh, but really these variants are, are fodder for scientists, for uh, laboratory investigations. We need to continue putting shots in the arms of people and Todd, while I'm at it, let me let me say that uh, history will define whether the prioritization of the elderly and the infirm uh, was the right way to proceed or not. And this may sound provocative uh, to your uh, to our listeners, uh, to our physicians and other listeners. I think uh, there is no doubt that frontline healthcare workers should have been at the very very front of the queue, and I think that's for obvious reasons. Uh, but when you go beyond that, had we taken a public health control perspective, we may in fact have vaccinated young people first, college kids, uh, other young people. Uh, and the reason is not because they mean more to us, not at all, but because they are exactly the people who are least likely to follow the recommendations of the CDC and the NIH and even their physicians. Uh, they want to congregate, they want to socialize, they want to have a spring break, they want to go to the beach with friends. And so ironically, what we did is we immunized those who were most likely to remain, uh, to remain uh, behind closed doors, those who were most likely to adhere to the recommendations of masking and social distancing. And again, I'll say with good cause, because they were at higher risk for uh, serious disease and death. But I do believe, um, should there be a pandemic like this in the future, we do need to revisit the staging of who got their vaccines first, second, third, and fourth, so that we could account both for the need to protect our patients and our fellow citizens on one hand, but also to stem the epidemic or the pandemic uh, more quickly on the other. You know, it's interesting. There, this is one of those situations where we're just kind of learning uh, across the course of this year on so many fronts, uh, unlike other things that we you know we're kind of more used to, this kind of retrospective look at our pandemic approach and vaccination approach, like who's who does that and how does that happen? So we get to a conclusion about what the right way is, or is that just really going to depend on what we're facing? Well, you know, Shakespeare in The Tempest said the past is prologue. And uh, in this case, we hope not. And the only way to prevent that is to begin now doc documenting, uh, analyzing, assessing, and reviewing uh, without, without great sense of uh, fear and panic. Uh, politicians generally don't like to be uh, assessed in that way, but we, we do need to do that. I happen to be privileged to be co-chairing a task force for North and South Carolina uh, for the two governors. Together, we are starting a review of uh, how these states could be better prepared in the future. And you can uh, be assured these are the kinds of things we'll be looking at. Uh, I think we need that at the federal level, too, uh, how to do that to try to, you know, be a little more devoid of politics than would generally be expected. I'm not sure. I hope the AMA could have a role in that. But we we better start doing it before too long, lest we forget both both the mistakes, but also the wonderful uh, contributions and 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 uh, decisions we've we've taken to date. Well, uh, a little bit closer in and kind of back to the uh, you know the increases that we're seeing right now. Um, some public health experts indicate you know that we have the tools to stop the increases that we're seeing, uh, but that we need to act quickly. So uh, you know we've been hearing terms like 
ring vaccination uh, to help control those clusters? You know, what do you think about a strategy like that? Well, great, great idea. You know, let me take us back to the only uh, infectious disease that was eradicated in our lifetimes, maybe not in yours, Todd, being so young, but uh, smallpox. And I can assure you that smallpox would still be with us if we had not taken that ring approach. And so when there were cases remaining on the planet, the WHO and its partners would go into uh, those communities, by the way, very remote, often often places with uh, displaced individuals or war-torn, uh, impoverished largely, and they would basically create a ring and make sure that 100% of the people within that ring were, were vaccinated uh, with the smallpox uh, uh, vaccine. And eventually that was the only way to stem it. Now, smallpox being a much more deadly virus than COVID, I don't mean to draw them together in the same way. But I do think right now we ought to be thinking about a ring a ring uh, approach. It may be a tad too early because if, if the spikes are distributed very widely, let's say throughout Michigan, it's very difficult to have a ring around Michigan. But if you have- It's a very pocket, big ring. Very big ring, too big a ring, not possible to <laughs> ring Michigan. Uh, but if we have pockets of where where the uh, uh, virus and the disease is spiking in a community, be it urban or rural, by bringing in mobile medical uh, units, uh, doing a lot of testing, but especially getting the vaccine out, this is a time for just putting the vaccine in the arms of people. And I would uh, redeploy resources, uh, whether it's a ring approach or some other uh, from within approach to get those communities vaccinated right now. I'm talking right now, this weekend, this upcoming weekend, next week, uh, or or the uh, ring will not hold. The uh, people will travel, visiting family, and then you'll see these spikes continuing. I, I'm very optimistic, Todd. This vi this pandemic is going away, but is it going to go away as as the president indicated? Hopefully. We can all have a fun July 4th weekend, he said recently, or will it be much later than, than that? Will really depend on these continued spikes and how well we, the public health and medical community, do at intervening with them sooner rather than later. Well, I like um, it's you know it's very interesting what you're you're saying because I think right now in the phase that we're in with vaccinations, it's kind of a state by state thing. But you're saying as we see kind of these flare ups. You know, it's almost like a vaccine SWAT team to move in yes. and employ this kind of ring strategy to kind of stop that in its tracks. Uh, so it's kind of a cross state prioritization there that we, you know, I haven't seen that happen yet. And by the way, it is exactly that. You know, I might take exception to the word ring only because that implies a circular type thing. It's often not a ring, but it, it is a focus approach. The, the CDC, they, they are expert. I'll go as far as saying they are the world's experts in that activity. And if they were to be uh, asked or uh, supported to do that, they could send uh, team members to these affected areas and recruit other medical personnel, uh, volunteers, and they, they could do an amazing job. This is what they do every single day. They have not done it with COVID, but they've done it with many, many other diseases, and they they do know how to do that and do it well and do it quickly. Well, uh, you know, what indicators should physicians be looking for, you know, right now to get an accurate picture of what's happening in their own communities so that we can, you know, be on guard to prevent something like this from happening in other places? Well, two Two places, I think. First of all, the uh, Johns Hopkins uh, uh, University uh, has a website that will tell you at a more macro level uh, how communities are doing. And I don't know that you could get down to the census tract or zip code, but you can get fairly narrow uh, with that. That's a good place to start. But maybe even better would be to look at the uh, CDC reports relative to vaccination rates. And if you're a practitioner in a community where, for whatever reason, the uh, vaccine uh, behavior has not been what we all hope it would be, you, you, you ought to be alarmed and concerned that you'll continue to be seeing positive COVID tests and 
all of the attendant uh, pressures on hospitalization and emergency rooms and um, um, and uh, respirator needs and all of that. And uh, so I think if I were a practitioner, that's what I would be trying. I would look at the vaccination rate as close to my community as I could find it and make that be the predictor of what I'm going to be seeing in practice for the, at least for the foreseeable future. Well, uh, you know, you wrote an article very early on in the pandemic entitled How to Reopen America. And in that you advocated for widespread testing, uh, particularly in antibody testing uh, as a tool for phased reopening. You know, it's something, you know, we had never really saw necessarily happen. Does, does antibody testing still have you know, a, a big place in our response uh, or a vaccine has changed that? And they, they have changed it. I think at the time that was the right thing to do. You know, Todd, many people, we've, we've just forgotten our basic virology 101, which basically says if you've gotten the disease, you're really very, very, very unlikely to get it again, at least anytime soon. And number two, if you've been vaccinated by a good vaccine, you are very, 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 very unlikely to get it at least anytime soon until there are new strains maybe. So we need to worry less about the, uh, about, uh, you know, who's had it. Uh, we need to worry about who's not vaccinated. Mm -hmm. uh, antibody testing, unfortunately, is a, it's a blood test. It's not a simple, it's not as simple as doing a COVID test. Uh, and, uh, and we really haven't done the large scale national studies that look at antibodies to see how well protected people are. Plenty of anecdotal evidence that they're well protected, but there are a whole lot of people with mild, who had mild cases back in April who may or may not be as well vaccinated as those of us listening today who've been fully vaccinated. And so, yeah, I think antibody testing still has a role and certainly in research it does. Uh, who had what strains, but I think that's kind of tomorrow. Let, let's take care of our people today and let's get them the shot in the arm. And uh, although there is some evidence of a very, very few people who have been vaccinated and appear to have gotten COVID, I want our listeners to know the numbers are extraordinarily low. We are talking about less than a, less than a part of a part of a percentage point with well over 100 million Americans having been vaccinated, there's some evidence that maybe a hundred or so. That is, you can do the math as well as me, that is uh, not unimportant to those people, but negligible. So we, we have the answer, we have the, you know, the fire hose, we just need to distribute it to people, especially young people. Let me just repeat, now is the time to get shots in the arms. Uh, several universities like Rutgers and Cornell have already announced that no student will be returning to campus in the fall without, uh, without a proof of vaccination. Um, that's, I think, the way most colleges will go uh, in the fall. Uh, there's also debate about a vaccine, call it what you will, passport. Uh, and I know that many Americans um, don't like that idea. They don't like their privacy invaded and they don't like restrictions on them. But I can assure you, those of us who plan to be going to Europe, for example, some countries in Europe later this summer in the fall, will need that vaccine passport, will need to show. Uh, and that's, uh, that's something. So I'm not making a political statement about a vaccine passport for the U.S. other than to say this is going to become more and more standardized within the U.S. If the government won't do it, Universities will do it. Places of employment will do it, and uh, I think we'll 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 grow more comfortable with that over time. Well, we're you know we're fortunate that the pace of vaccinations has you know accelerated so dramatically here in the U.S. But you know we're seeing uh, varying rates of that, of course, uh, globally. And you know back to the article that you wrote about reopening. You you called for vaccine production to gear up worldwide simultaneously, saying you know quote. Nothing would be worse than an international food fight uh, about access to the vaccine, especially among the haves and the have nots. Is that, you know, what we're seeing right now? And if so, you know, what's got to happen to change that? Well, it's too late to, 
to change it fundamentally to uh, having to change the supply chain for Europe. That's not something you or I could do anything about. I think when they do their review, they need to look at what didn't work properly there. I would also say, though, that they generally in Europe have have and have more compliant populations relative to lockdowns. Not everywhere. The Italians are up in arms right now. But by and large, they were more compliant than Americans were by and large to uh, to restrictions. Uh, yeah, America is uh, America's just about to have a glut. And uh, that is a good thing. Uh, but how we how we deploy it uh, and, uh, you know, do you go with our neighbors to the north and south? Do you, do you offer to Mexico and Canada first as an example? Um, I believe we need to offer vaccines to international students. Uh, that's my field, higher education. Uh, international students who are planning to come to the U.S. for the fall, I think we should we should supply the vaccine uh, to those uh, individuals because we want them here, but we need them to be healthy as well. But beyond that, what countries do we help in what order? Uh, I do believe, by the way, though, that hoarding or warehousing uh, millions of, of uh, vaccines is not a good idea for the United States, mainly because I believe should there be a need for continuing vaccination in 20, later in 2021 or in 2022, those vaccines are probably not the ones we would be taking. Uh, uh, same platform, but different concoction or formulary. And so I think to save those at great uh, logistical expense and the freezer uh, refrigeration needs to have them around when there are people around the world who will maintain the pandemic in spite of Americans largely having been vaccinated is not a great idea, but it's not in my realm to, to you know, to uh, recommend how they be deployed. But I think it's a good time to begin thinking about how they would be be shared with other people in other countries. Well, thank you uh, so much, Dr. Pastidi. So, uh, your comments are so thoughtful, and I really, really appreciate your perspective and being here today. That's it for today's COVID-19 update. We'll be back with another segment shortly. In the meantime, for resources on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. Please take care.